Hello, I'm Katie Murphy. I'm the Communications Associate for the Coalition for Juvenile Justice, and I'm here with my colleague Naomi Smoot, CJJ's Policy and Government Relations Associate. Welcome today to today's webinar on ending the detention of non-delinquent youth in rural communities. Uh, just as a reminder, we are recording this webinar, and the recording and the PowerPoint will be made available on CJJ's website within 24 hours. I just wanted to run through a few technical details before we begin the webinar. First, you'll notice that all participants are in listen-only mode. At the end of the presentation, we'll do a Q&A, and there are two ways to uh, pose your questions. First, you can, um, at the end of the presentation, click the raise your hand button, and I can unmute you and announce to you, and you could ask your question. Or you can type in your question at any point during the in the questions box throughout the presentation. We do recommend that if you are on a cell phone that you use the questions box so that we can avoid any audio feedback issues. Uh, now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our speakers. Judge George Timberlake has served as the chair of the Illinois Juvenile Justice Commission since 2010, and he's an alternate member of the Federal Advisory Committee on Juvenile Justice. He was a trial court judge for 23 years prior to his 2006 retirement as chief judge of Illinois Second Circuit, which is comprised of 12 counties in southeastern Illinois. He's also a member of the Illinois Models for Change Coordinating Council, the Illinois Juvenile Justice Leadership Council, the Redeploy Illinois Overs Oversight Board, and the Board of the Juvenile Justice Initiative. He is the president of the Jefferson Policy Consultants in Mount Vernon, Illinois. Judge Lisa Mance has served as the associate judge in the Newton County Juvenile Court in Georgia since 2002. Her prior legal experience includes serving as the Special Assistant Attorney General for Newton County, Putnam County, and Jasper County Departments of Family and Children, and the Newton County Office of Child Support Enforcement, and as a Municipal Prosecutor. She is active in the Council of Juvenile Court Judges, where she currently serves as Chairperson of the Behavioral Health, Developmental Disability, and Additive D Disease Community, Vice Chair of the Delinquency Committee, and Chairperson of the Delinquency Improvement Initiative, and as member of the Education and Certification Committee. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Judge Timberlake. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for uh, being here today. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about uh, a response to truancy. And uh, following that, uh, Judge Mentz is going to talk to you about uh, duly involved kids. So uh, as an introduction, I think that we um, all know, uh, at least I hope you all know, that uh, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention is charged with uh, maintaining uh, adherence to the four core requirements, one of which is not to detain uh, uh, children who are charged only with status offenses. Status offenses being those who, uh, which are uh, not offenses but for the age of the child involved. So in other words, school truancy being one of them. Uh, also uh, for underage drinking, for tr uh, curfew violations, those sorts of things that but for the child's age would not be an offense for which there could be incarceration. So to begin that kind of discussion, uh, let's talk about truancy. And can we go to slide one, please? Um, what I would like you to understand is that uh, I was a judge for 23 years before retiring eight years ago. And in that entire time period, I, I lived in a rural circuit, which is huge, uh, and which uh, typifies perhaps 15% of the total population. So rural communities make up 72% of the nation's land area. Uh, and the Census Bureau estimates that about 46.2 million people, or roughly 15% of the U.S. population resides in rural counties, uh, rural locations. Those communities face many unique challenges in slide two. One of those uh, that's easily understandable is just transportation. In my own circuit, uh, the Second Judicial Circuit of Illinois, it comp uh, compiles, is compiled of 12 uh, counties in the southeastern cor corner of the state. That's 4,800 square miles, roughly the uh, area of the state of Connecticut. And that transfer, uh, the, the transportation needs to access services in and of themselves uh, is enormous. Compounding that is the fact that uh, there's limited program availability for responses for any juvenile problems, let alone truancy. 
And in that regard, um, even if uh, in your entire uh, jurisdictional area you have enough kids for a program, it may simply not be possible to to create that kind of a response to truancy or other juvenile needs simply because you can't uh, put that many kids in the same place at the same time to support a service provider's ability to produce a program, at least to produce it uh, economically. So that's the backdrop for what, uh, what we're going to talk about in terms of truancy today. Uh, and then the next slide, please. So as a juvenile court judge uh, in my uh, relative youth, I'll tell you that uh, I recognize, and many people recognize, that truancy was the first public indicator of problems in many kids' lives. So being separated either uh, by themselves or by others from the school community, that, that public community to which they were attached, when they uh, disappear from school, something may very well be wrong. It's often a sign of a larger underlying issue. In the most terrible circumstances, that is, uh, kids don't go to school because their parents or caregivers uh, are hiding child abuse or child neglect. It can be something as simple as, as being poor and not having clothes to go to school, but it certainly can be something as serious as um, physical abuse, sexual abuse of a child. In, uh, in one instance in my own past, uh, my wife, a, a school uh, speech therapist, was concerned about a, an individual child. And attention was brought to that child. It turned out that the child was uh, literally kidnapped and was living with a person who had enrolled them in school but had no parental rights and, and no familial uh, responsibility or connection to that kid. So that's an extreme example uh, of why truancy is, is often uh, is, is an issue that needs to be attended to. And the, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act uh, would appear to uh, prevent a child who is truant from being detained. But I have to tell you that uh, in too many cases, and, uh, and still in over 10,000 cases in the, in the United States in the last year, kids were detained solely for being truant. And I'll tell you that in my also distant past, I detained kids uh, for want of any other solution. And uh, that's certainly inappropriate. But because of the uh, violation of a valid court order exception, uh, those kinds of violations are not counted against a state's um, target, uh, targets or de minimis targets for uh, detaining kids as a violation of a uh, status offense. I want to bring that home in something that is that just happened to me in the last 30 minutes. Uh, in 2003, while I was chief judge of the, the 12th County Circuit that I mentioned, uh, we, we opened a new juvenile detention center, state-of-the-art, well-run. Uh, I had the pleasure of selecting the people who uh, would work there. And 30 minutes ago, I got an email from that uh, detention center and, and from our state compliance monitor for uh, uh, status offense detention cases. And a 12-year-old boy hung himself yesterday and died. Now, he wasn't a truant. Uh, he had been detained. Uh, this was the fourth time in the last year for burglary. But the point being, detention is not appropriate for a status offense and is seldom appropriate for any uh, kid uh, in, in distress. So that makes it important, uh, the subject we're talking about here today. So in our circuit, we, we identified truancy as an issue that was more than important. It was, in some instances, life-threatening if detention was involved. And uh, we looked at the idea that uh, we needed an alternative for a truancy problem. Uh, it also became quite apparent in the coalition of service providers, court personnel, um, law enforcement officials and school personnel that we needed a, 
a multi-pronged approach if we were actually going to do something about truancy as part of the larger issue of, of seeking positive outcomes for kids. Next slide, please. So we looked at not a, the state statute, first of all, and a truant minor in need, in need of supervision case can only be filed in Illinois after 18 consecutive unexcused absences in the last 18, or rather the last 180 days. So in other words, a kid could miss 10% of the school days uh, without excuse before, must have 18 absences before a case could be filed in court. Now, in fact, we had 20 of those cases, which meant that uh, at a local level, somebody was not paying attention. In Illinois, we have 32 regional school districts, regional school superintendents, and they are charged with uh, monitoring truancy, truancy policies and truancy numbers in those counties within that regional uh, district. That was partially a response to the fact that building principles, individual building principles, which we all know can become fiefdoms, uh, uh, did not sometimes want to disclose that uh, truancy uh, was taking place in their in their individual building. Sometimes that was because they didn't want their uh, state aid uh, financial uh, calculation to to go in the negative category. In other uh, cases, it was simply the kids who were truant were kids who would cause problems in that school building, and therefore they didn't really mind that they were absent. So without any particular intervention, uh, cases were brought in juvenile court which uh, alleged truancy, a truant minor in need of supervision. The problem is those had to be filed by the state's attorney. Some state's attorneys did, some state's attorneys didn't. But when those, uh, those petitions are filed, too often there was no real response. And that's how we found ourselves. Uh, using detention as a, uh, a negative incentive to attend school. That didn't work. So uh, as a part of the collaborative, we took a look at how we could respond. And the first, uh, the first instances were the development of truancy review boards. Now that's what we call them. And uh, it was simply an attempt to bring together a, a staffing group a multidisciplinary staffing group to consider truancy cases prior to their being filed in court or uh, if filed as a response prior to adjudication uh, for that individual kid's efforts or individual kid's uh, difficulties. And so doing uh, the, often the state's attorneys, but often uh, other members of the school community suggested that there needed to be a, a case before the truancy review board. Because this was a uh, multidisciplinary collaborative who came up with this response, it included law enforcement. And at least in uh, the county in which I sat, the Jefferson County, Illinois, the sheriff volunteered to serve notices upon parents of truancy review board hearings. And there's something about a uniformed officer knocking on your door with a piece of paper that says uh, you got to come to this hearing that in, ensured um, most parents' attendance. Now, there's no statutory basis for that, and it wasn't a summons. There's no, no uh, uh, negative statute, no sanction for not attending. But the point was it was important to the community, it was important to the sheriff, and therefore uh, it had a sense of urgency for the parent. At such a truancy review board hearing, uh, hearing is a, uh, a misnomer in the sense that there was no presiding judge, there was no uh, prosecuting attorney. Rather, it was a group of individuals, certainly with a moderator, but a group of individuals from, from many different walks of life who were going to consider what was going on in that child's life outside of school. Those included uh, members of our child welfare uh, system in Illinois, the Department of Children and Family Services, school personnel, uh, mental health counselors, uh, service providers uh, who otherwise provided uh, counseling and therapeutic 
youth services aimed at juveniles, uh, as well as members of the court community. Certainly, uh, many of our judges uh, and state's attorneys, primarily assistant state's attorneys, as well as uh, public defenders, uh, attended those cases, uh, partially because they wanted to, because they were interested, but also um, because they understood as a group that the court process was not suited for truants. And the court process, particularly in our huge geographic area, often had nothing to add to the conversation about why a kid uh, was truant. Uh, those worked extraordinarily well. Uh, two things happened as a result of that. First of all was um, that there was a uh, statutory change to require regional offices of education to insert uh, some kind of remediation between the, the fact that they had uh, uh, noticed truancy and filing a petition in court, even if it were 18 absences. So could we go to uh, slide eight, please? So as a part of this process, uh, the uh, statute was amended to require uh, and this intermediate step. And in the last statutory change to that statute, when it was going to be made worse rather than better, we were able to insert uh, that a truancy review board process uh, was, uh, would excuse the regional office of education from saying that it did nothing. So there's an overt requirement that the school board, the school superintendent, must uh, certify that they did nothing nobody wants to do that, or that they used one of these alternative measures, and the Truancy Review, Review Board was part of that. Now, I apologize for this, but let's go back to uh, slide seven. As a result of this, policies were put in place in counties with uh, Truancy Review Boards, and today there is a uniform attendance policy in the Second Judicial Circuit which was agreed to and developed by the five different regional super, uh, superintendents that reside within that huge geographic area. And under this system, uh, a number of things changed. Uh, first of all, notices were uh, the notification process for parents of kids who were truant was vastly expedited. So at three absences, there was a telephone call to uh, the parents saying, hey, we noticed uh, uh, Johnny was not in class uh, for three unexcused absences. We're just checking in to see if anything's wrong. That escalates to a uh, letter uh, and uh, an uh, email contact, and then finally to the uh, sheriff's contact that we refer that I earlier referred to for a truancy review board hearing. That in itself had a dramatic effect on. Uh, truancy petitions, but also upon truancy. And back to slide eight. And actually, we can go on to slide nine. Parents who are served with the notice of the truancy re uh, review uh, board hearing uh, are necessary, obviously. We can all, all assume that. But the truth is that in some uh, school districts and in some individual buildings, the notification was a note given to the child when he happened to show up in school to take home to the parents. And that was sort of the end of it. In this case, uh, we recognize that uh, family involvement is essential. Because what the child may not be able to say uh, herself uh, can well be discovered by a conversation with the parent. But you have to create that conversation. We all know that some schools are unwelcoming to parents. Parents who fail that school, either uh, educationally or socially, uh, don't feel welcome to walk back through the doors of a place that is not uh, reflective of a happy time, but rather of failure, uh, punishment, and ultimately, for many of them, dropping out. So the outreach to those parents is uh, completely important. And the Truancy Review Board hearings that I refer to are most often held outside the school building in some neutral place. We often use the courthouse in my own county. That has its own problems, of course, but uh, the 
idea is to create as welcoming an environment for that parent as possible. At these hearings, as I mentioned, it is uh, an informal procedure. And uh, although there's an introduction by the moderator and people uh, uh, understand not only the uh, amount of truancy and its frequency, uh, but its nature. So uh, there's also an included provision now that limits the number of excused absences that can be made and uh, requires doctor's excuses after a certain period of time. So after describing that, it's pretty much an open conversation. And it's amazing what can happen when there are educated, committed, uh, compassionate individuals who obviously are interested in the welfare of the child asking questions and, re and requiring answers. Of course, those convers conversations are sometimes heated, but uh, that's, that's rare, at least for it to be only an argument instead of a discussion with a resolution. I've seen magic happen in those hearings in which uh, abuse is reported, uh, financial problems are reported. Uh, you discover uh, familial situations that you otherwise would not have imagined. And when, when the people in the hearing can immediately respond with policy, uh, with, with services provided by policy in their communities, it, it really can solve enormous numbers of problems, not just related to truancy. So a mental health worker at that hearing can set a, a meeting, can set a, uh, a conference, an appointment for that parent or that child right there in that room. It's not, uh, it's not trying to wind your way through a public system. Rather, it is, here are people who can help, and we're going to do that right now. That, that leads to all kinds of other situations, uh, other responses. But I'll tell you that it's just extraordinarily useful. Slide nine, please. These, um, these hearings uh, have no sanctions if the parent doesn't come. These hearings have no sanctions of their own to say to a parent, you're going to go to jail. Uh, they have no authority uh, with which to detain the child or to require any other uh, action on behalf of parent or child. The point is, it's a nurturing environment that is genuinely interested in solving, uh, solving the problems of that kid. Slide 10, please. Again, as to the enormous geography that faces many of our uh, rural communities, uh, it's sometimes difficult to have a response to an individual kid. So I'll mention Washington, Washington Aggression Interruption Training uh, or Aggression Replacement Therapy, as some of you may know, know, know that program. So we all know that that's extraordinarily uh, helpful for uh, kids involved in violence. We know it's an evidence-based practice that can be produced uh, or that can produce significant results in kids. And so in the traditional kind of fighting at school sort of a situation, it's a rationally uh, suggested approach to that kid's individual problems. You got to have a certain number of kids in that group before it can go forward. So now in Illinois, Nels Nelson, uh, one of the authors of the program, is experimenting with uh, video uh, groups in order to, to reach that critical mass where work can be done. It's only a pilot effort, but it's certainly something that's useful. Also in our community, uh, for our communities in southern Illinois, in, uh, for many, many years, there was no, not one, child psychiatrist in uh, the south end of the state. And that means south of half of the state, the south half of the state. So we have also been experimenting with and, and have uh, good results for telemedicine, telepsychiatry, and to some degree with counseling. Those technologies can certainly uh, improve the possibility that rural communities have access to services needed in their individual towns without having the requisite uh, number of kids for that group. I continue to believe that truancy is the first public indicator of problems in a child's life. It may be something as a uh, something as simple as a tummy ache uh, can be something as terrible as child abuse. So having an adequate response that is less than punitive, that is in fact the opposite of punitive, is the kind of magic that judges can uh, lead the 
way to. Uh, if, if we understand the difficulties in kids' lives, then I think it behooves us to do all we can to respond in a way that produces positive outcomes for those kids in our communities. We're going to have questions and answers at the end of uh, the session, and I know Judge Manson and I would both welcome, welcome those. Thank you. Great. We'll uh, turn the presentation over to Judge Mance, and uh, we'll, like he said, we'll take questions at the end. Thank you all. Um, so it's interesting that we would all come to the topic of how important truancy is in our work. Um, and one of the, uh, I guess, differences or maybe distinctions in Georgia is that we have a state board of education, um, but we all of our school districts are um, independent. Um, so we have 181 school districts um, in the state of Georgia. Um, and as far as counties that wise, Newton County is about 279 square miles, and we don't have any public transportation. So even though we might have just under 100,000 people and 20,000 children in school, we struggle with also having transportation to programs as well because um, we're across that county and we don't have public transportation. So I was looking something up interesting, and I'm, I'm kind of a fan of the irony sometimes. In 1893, just so you all know, Newton County was the first county in the United States to offer public school free transportation. So I find it ironic that we're on the phone today talking about the lack of transportation in rural counties. So um, we have had a wonderful history of collaboration um, in our community, and we've had the opportunities to work with many agencies, national, um, working on detention alternatives with Annie E. Casey, working with SAMHSA to do system of care work around um, children with SED. So we've, we've always been able to work collaboratively, and I think that's what we've learned with this population is that you really have to think about how this is a family and a community problem because not only can you not legally um, detain children for these, I mean, it's, it's kind of not probably the most appropriate response for the situations that these children are in. But one of the most exciting, uh, I think, initiatives that we've been able to work on uh, was the, um, and as you see on the slide, uh, was the MacArthur Foundation and Robert F. Kennedy's Action um, Course Models for Change Systems Reform and Juvenile Justice Initiative. And we were one of four sites in the nation uh, selected to look at the duly involved, the crossover youth, um, and some best practices. And in Georgia, there is a thing on the screen that's called the Local Interagency Planning Team Meeting. And that is um, a meeting that exists in every county in the state of Georgia. It is in our behavioral health code. It is the um, way that you're supposed to staff a child who has a severe emotional disturbance and follow the system of care principles, the family-oriented um, driven practices. And so um, it was very, as we go through the slides, you'll see that it's, um, it was a nice marriage of, um, of different mediums that do the same thing. So I guess we can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we found in coming up with solutions would be to have agency head involvement. Um, if your various stakeholders show commitment, um, it indicates that there's commitment to the process, that there's value to the work that we're doing, that there is a huge importance of the value of collaborating to serve the families and youth, and that we have collective outcomes. Um, when you get together, you realize that we have um, common denominators, and then we are also serving the missions of our agencies as well as the, the collective of the community. Um, so it was very important that um, when we did this work that the chief judge of the juvenile court, that the head of our local DFACS and our DJJ were involved, but also we had the buy-in from at the state level. So state level DJJ, state level DFACS, the, the governor's office, um, the governor's office of children and families. If you are, next slide, please. If you are not familiar with um, the crossover youth, we've put the definitions up that are part of the crossover youth practice model, and obviously on the slide is how you get there. Um, and so they go from children who have experienced both delinquency and, mal and maltreatment, children who have are receiving services from both system, and then children who are in the courts for both. So we wanted to see, um, because we knew anecdotally 
that the children um, coming to court seem to feel like they could be in either category. I would sometimes say that it feels like we have delinquent children, children who are charged with delinquent offenses in front of us, and they look like they should be on the dependency side of the house, but they don't have the protections of child welfare. And I don't know if that's anybody else's feeling when they work with our families. So we were able to do a data review. Can you go to the next slide, please? to look at our juvenile court referrals in that snapshot window from November 2012 to November of 2013. And we looked at complaints uh, that were filed in the juvenile court in that time period, um, but not, not traffic offenses, and uh, who also simultaneously would have had a open defects case. And that referral in our, in our case included those that were not substantiated. So any con any time a family might have been referred to defects. And we found 114 youth fell into that population, which for us ended up being 56% of all of our court referrals at that time. Um, what we were able, just from demographics, you can see the um, we are geographic, I guess, um, the majority of the referrals were African American. We're about a 50 50 split in our county, and 45% were female and 55% were male. We had an average age of 14.3 months, and interestingly, the severity of the offense was status offenses. The ones that Judge Timberlake just um, described were the same ones that we looked at, then followed by misdemeanors, then followed by felonies. And um, as you can see the theme, the most common status offense that um, was charged was, was truancy, and then followed by ungovernable. Um, it's not on this slide, but one of the other more disturbing pieces was that while the number was smaller, there were um, a number of aggravated offenses, like sexual offenses, as the young children being the perpetrators. So there seemed to be this, um, either it was this or these very aggressive crimes. So when we looked at who we were going to consider in our population, we did the status offenses as well as that small subsection uh, as well. And then most of these children obviously were not re removed and placed in, in state custody. So at the time that the, um, these complaints were filed, they had had an average of 13 months of defects involvement with the case. So if you can go to the next slide. So as I said earlier, that we call it the LIPT, some people call it the LIPIT, but um, this is a meeting that was initially designed to use for um, children with severe emotional disturbances to prevent out-of-home placement and to pre prevent further involvement in our systems. And so at that meet, we used this meeting, it was, our meeting has always been active, but we decided that since all of the stakeholders um, that normally would get together to staff the family were familiar with this meeting, we scheduled our meeting um, of these children to staff at, um, at the same time. And so if you can go to the next slide, you can see that um, the participants are just as uh, the Judge Timberlake described, the family members, foster parents, representatives of the Department of Juvenile Justice, DFACS, Juvenile Court, our Board of Education. Um, either the private or the public providers of behavioral health services. Uh, for us, coming out of a PRTF, a, a psychiatric residual treatment program, the children are supposed to be staffed so that services can be put in place. Um, and you can see the other, anybody else that had a significant um, contact with the child would obviously be included. Other slide, next slide, please. So, and as I said earlier, I won't read it all, but I mean, we picked that meeting because the, the meeting was a meeting of coordinated system of care. Um, and if you can, if you want to go ahead and skip to the, the next slide. So what we wanted to make sure that we were doing when we staffed with these children to find appropriate um, interventions was that they were, of course, the least restrictive and most effective that um, that it was early, that they, that they, um, all the children's legal rights were protected, and that the parent and the child were um, involved in the development of the plan, and also um, that the 
other stakeholders who were supposed to do stuff, that their parts of the plan were, were created as well. And we do use this meeting also if we have a child who is unrestorably um, not able to stand trial, um, they would go over here now and the care management plan around an incompetent to ch child would also be done the same way. Do you want to go to the next slide? I think we've already talked about There we go. So how that helped us with our work is that we, we went through various stages of um, committees and uh, having a researcher and knowing what outcomes we were looking for. So we knew that we needed to change how we ran a meeting um, to focus on the outcome measures, the strengths and the risks, the treatment needs of the children that we were seeing, um, that we could collect the data that could um, help us go further. Um, we mapped the whole juvenile process with our stakeholders so that all of our stakeholders understood how each of us worked together, which was fascinating because we really didn't always understand what the other person did. So I think that was very good. Um, and we also developed a full assessment matrix of everything that's available for children and families by all the different agencies. Um, my pride and joy was we were able to develop a statewide data sharing agreement, which took a year, a little bit longer to get through, but uh, that was actually challenging and was uh, what's what allowed us to actually get to the data. And last year, um, in 2014, our, our, our new reform code went into effect. And so for the first time ever now, we have what's called our CHINS population. So before that, uh, we did not have that category. And so we are now working through um, what that means, what that looks like to, to officially not have it to be um, considered any kind of criminal, criminal offense. Um, and so that this, this process has allowed us to develop um, an idea of how to handle those children. I will say that um, there have been some challenges with the new code. Because the, um, the code basically said this is, this is not a delinquent offense anymore, um, the prosecutors who normally prosecuted the cases are, are prohibited from being the, basically presenting the cases on behalf of the state. So that's made it interesting. We have gone to an accountability uh, board uh, similar to what Judge Timberlake had described, but it's actually, upon complaint by the court, referred to the board instead of using uh, what we used to have a court, the like a truancy court in court because we didn't want to do it in the court. And it was interesting to hear because we flipped. We decided that we would do it at the school board office as opposed to the court because we didn't want to bring the children to the court. But um, I think this has been an interesting process as we continue to figure out how to engage the families and provide the, the right services. Um, we have a range of diversions, but we certainly know with this population, and I would think with any other population, that um, once you know that you can't use any kind of incarceration or criminal standards, you have to come up with effective interventions that that meet the family's needs. And I think that that's probably going to be any jurisdiction's challenge and continuing to be ours as we go forward is to what do you do when this doesn't, intervention doesn't work? How do, you, how do you go forward with those things? So um, we are very excited to be part of the work, um, but I think there's much more work to do. So I hope I've finished with enough time to allow time for questions. Am I OK? Yeah, you're great. Um, so first, I wanted to thank both of our presenters um, and just to remind everyone that there are two ways to, to send in your questions. First, you can click the raise your hand button um, and we can unmute you. Um, or you can enter your questions in through the questions box. Um, we do suggest that if you're on a cell phone that you use the questions box to avoid any audio feedback issues. Um, and I'll just give everyone a, a minute or so to uh, enter their questions. You mentioned um, diversion programs. Are there any diversion programs that you found work best in rural communities? Um, do you want to take that, Judge Timberlake? Or me? is that me? We, for us, we, we developed, um, we have like an intake diversion where they meet with the probation officer or with, with our intake officer. And we also use a balanced and restorative justice. So if there have been crimes where they've done harm to a, where there's a victim, we, we do that intervention. Um, but now that goes kind of back into the, to the, to the um, 
back on the delinquency side. So in our traditional intake, our diversion where they meet with a case manager, we try and make sure that um, we have assessments done um, to address any kind of mental health issues or any kind of behavioral health issues and um, assist the family with referrals. Like even if it's something as simple as making, link, making that link to the uh, provider that takes the insurance and is able to work with the family. So while we have a continuum of diversion programs, um, I think, like I said, switching it from the CHINS population to the, we have a very good Girls Steps program that has involved CHINS, which where we use a curriculum called Girls Moving On and the mentoring and um, kind of group counseling where the moms and the, and the, the daughters have interactions and separate counseling that's a, that's a court that we preside over. But, um, Specifically saying just for status offenses, I think that that's part of the work now going forward that we'll need to look and see, you know, um, how we break all that out. I'm sorry if I don't have a good answer for that. If I may add, I, I think the important uh, issue to consider here is just the individual treatment of a child. And that is somewhat, uh, that's part of the benefit of having a multidisciplinary uh, group who not only holds a hearing in a truancy review board, but also uh, is not staffing the child, but certainly is acquiring enough information that an appropriate diversion uh, method might be used. In, uh, and in response to, to promising programs right now, uh, one of the issues that, that is um, associated with the idea of, of inappropriate detention uh, is uh, as much as um, inappropriate use of detention for currency is domestic violence. You know, we often find not only uh, in, in kids who show up in detention or in our crisis intervention therapy, but that kids are removed from home because someone has to go and uh, mom and dad have been beating each other up, but somebody's got to stay and take care of the kids. So a juvenile uh, who has become involved in that uh, domestic violence situation is the one who is removed and charged. Now, obviously, this is a tangent, but the, the point I'd like to make is we've developed an adolescent domestic battery a protocol and screening uh, instrument and, and are still struggling with appropriate responses, although the step-up program uh, is, is effective for at least a, a specified portion of that population. It's not normed for a low income, it's not normed for those with uh, mental health issues, but it's a response that is, is uh, wonderfully effective for a specific group. I mention that because, first of all, we're using it in Illinois and, and um, uh, collecting evidence on its use in Illinois, but the point is that's a very specific program, and uh, if truancy is the indicator of a problem as opposed to the problem itself, finding that right intervention is extraordinarily important. And in Judge Mance's uh, example, the, um, the population that is both uh, abused, neglected, or children in need of supervision, uh, are, we're talking about the same kids with the same kind of problems and the same kind of families. And it's important to have not only mental health screening, uh, but a real conversation about what's going on in that family's life with anyone who can add to it and uh, then select an appropriate diversion program. It may not, it may not exist. You may uh, find that there's a need in your community that simply isn't met, and that's the value also of a collaborative approach. Okay, our next question is for Judge Timberlake. Uh, who was the moderator for the Truancy Review Board, and how did you handle confidentiality? A good point. Uh, the moderator uh, it varies. Uh, they uh, rotate so that no one person is, uh, this is free, by the way. These hearings take place in the evening, and individuals volunteer for that effort. Even though they're employed in agencies that are child-serving agencies, that doesn't mean that they get overtime or any conversation, uh, compensation for that. So uh, it rotates, uh, chosen by the group, uh, and uh, often uh, has, depending on where this takes place in these 12 counties, uh, has either a volunteer or a court personnel or some other person who handles the logistics of it. In our own 
circuit. We have a circuit-wide juvenile justice council, another collaboration on on a uh, area-wide basis, and uh, there is an employed uh, juvenile uh, justice council coordinator, and uh, she organizes, uh, at least in in Home County, Jefferson County, she organizes the. Um, not only the hearings, but also the moderators, and often serves as moderator herself. And our next question is in relation to other behaviors besides truancy that you may have encountered that are problematic, such as um, runaway youth. And what sort of community programs have you used to address runaway youth? I'll just jump in first, and that is, in Illinois, there is uh, a program, uh, a very, uh, 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 very badly named as the Comprehensive Community-Based Youth Services, which we refer to as CCBYS or CIVIS. It is, in fact, a crisis intervention service that, that covers the entire state. And through our Department of Health, uh, rather, Department of Human Services, uh, every county as a contracted provider who provides 24-7 um, response to uh, a, a number of specified groups. Runaway youth is one of and is actually the primary group. Uh, the service provider has to, uh, to appear within 90 minutes from the call from a school or a police officer, no matter where in that in that service area uh, that contract takes place. In Chicago, it has to be within uh, 45 minutes uh, because of the density of population and the, and the density of service providers. That service, the, the person who shows up, the caseworker, is trained in mediation and uh, has the charge to uh, resolve the issues that keeps the kid uh, away from home. And it's the reverse also. It's not just runaways, it's also lockouts. And either resolve that or find a, a safe and stable uh, place for that child uh, in the interim into working out a case plan for those, uh, for the parent and child. And those services can, uh, the case management at least, last for up to six months. I'll tell you that that's a great design. And as with many things, uh, the uh, the application of it sometimes falters. We redid all of those contracts last year so that there is better coverage and better understanding of, of what the, the job is for that crisis intervention. The problem is, and this is specifically a rural, pro rural problem, is that that intervention service contract is based upon caseload and in a large geographic, or rather a very rural uh, area, that population may be relatively small compared to the geography itself, so that the dollars are too small. So in the past, what we had were case agencies who took that contract and then didn't provide the service, partially partially because they couldn't. Financially, they would hit their caseload target or hourly target much too soon, and so even if they provided good service, the first two months of the fiscal year, the rest of the year they didn't. So, you know, <laughs> follow the money. It, it's still true that in rural areas, the rurality itself is an impediment to providing effective services. And you may well have to lobby your legislature to, to make that a better, a better approach. And if I could just follow up, um, I wrote a note because I was like, we have a crisis uh, unit like that, but I don't think that runaway is one of the things that they consider a crisis to respond to. So I made a note to that. Um, I think that it's, it's always, I think, the scariest charge because you don't know where the children are going. And I think that one of the responses um, that the state of Georgia has done is to look at it from the prevention of children who are being sexually um, trafficked or exploited because that is truancy and the, um, the running away are some of the higher risk factors for that. So the, governor, uh, the governor's office, um, there's now an initiative called Georgia Cares, which is a public-private um, group to help 
with children who are sexually exploited or at risk of being sexually exploited. And there's also an organization called Youth Sparks, which um, is in um, Fulton County, but is also developing protocols and education and ways to um, intervene um, to, to recognize those risk times. And I know that they were creating a curriculum that should be online or out of online soon um, that we were hoping to use uh, with the with any of the children that came up in that particular situation. But I think of all of the offenses that we would consider staff offenses, that is the one that I think is the hardest for anybody to deal with. And Judge Timberlake, how do you how do you respond to that? I mean, I don't. I think we get scared when children just go off and run away, um, and we don't know why, and we're scared that they're not going to stay in their home if you bring them back. I think that's a, a fear, a valid fear that lots of people have, and it kind of is hard to deal with in a sta in in that idea of status offense um, from a safety perspective. Judge, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I do in the sense that the uh, because it's a dedicated population for our crisis intervention service, it doesn't mean that the kid is necessarily going home. The point is to try to discover why the kid ran away in the first place and then to respond to that situation as opposed to a knee-jerk reaction as you, you got to go back to mom or dad. In fact, that crisis intervention agency has the authority to make a hotline report from a uh, to the child welfare agency and uh, in, you know, instigate a, an, an immediate response, an immediate petition uh, for that kid to be uh, removed from the home or placed in shelter care. Most cases are such that um, you know, a, a relative or a friend or uh, a shelter care facility can be implemented in the interim. But the idea is to, to respond to whatever problems created the runaway situation without going to court if you can uh, in the situation of, of an abused uh, child or a, a trafficked child. That's a totally different situation. That's, that's where the legal uh, community is, is well suited to respond. That's the rare situation, uh, but it is uh, certainly the one that keeps, keeps us up at night. And, you, and you're right to be um, specifically concerned about uh, the conditions that led to a, a kid running away. Our next question is for Judge Timberlake. It's who initiated the referrals? Was it the school, probation, or child protective? Or truancy, excuse me. Okay. Uh, it, uh, it was the Regional Office of Education because, uh, first of all, we had a champion there. Uh, because the Illinois statute uh, puts the responsibility for truancy responses on that regional office. The, uh, we, we had members of that office in our circuit-wide and county-wide collaboration. And so when we, when we uh, identified the problem of truancy as something we had to respond to because we were not effective at it, because we knew in cases that were just egregious, and that um, Ultimately, the judge who was sending the kids to detention uh, woke up and said, uh, this, is, this is wrong. That was me, by the way. Uh, everything I've learned is from the mistakes I made, which uh, hopefully did not enter too many families or children. So uh, because we had the champion in the regional suit's office, uh, his assistant regional superintendent, who had this truancy uh, responsibility, in his job description, he readily came to the table. And I'll tell you, that was, it was unusual because at that time, the state, uh, the state Board of Education's uh, truancy uh, assistant was advocating for statutes to specifically allow detention for, uh, for truant kids. It was this uh, terrible, <laughs> You know, it was an alternate universe when I would go to speak to one of their conferences and find this guy standing up before me uh, advocating for exactly what I was there to try, try to explain was, was terrible uh, in violation of the, the uh, national statute. Uh, and so we found a champion who really uh, went down our path. And in addition, the uh, attorney
attorney, then attorney general picked up the issue um, within 18 months after we had uh, instigated this initiative and also made it a part of the attorney general's programming response. So they began training throughout the state and, and that really helped. Uh, the, the issue is money, as is often the case. And in, uh, there is no money for that in Illinois, either for currency responses or currency review boards. But if the community uh, and its collaboration takes up an issue that's important, it seems like you can always find a way. And that certainly was our experience. Time for one last question. Um, in recent years, there has been a lot of budget tightening across the country. How are you dealing with the challenges of being rural communities in light of even tighter than normal budgets? That was a big response, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, it, it, even in 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 budgetary fat times, uh, many, many uh, social needs go without adequate funding. And uh, as well as collaborating, collaborating on individual cases, I think if you have a group in, in uh, your county, your region, your state, who recognizes that this is important, that collaboration can also organize to advocate for better funding. or perhaps more specifically, to advocate for better use of funding that is available. As I mentioned in our crisis intervention um, programs in the past, there were millions of dollars being spent for services that were never provided, partially because they weren't effectively and efficiently allocated, but partially because there was no one watching the store, literally. There was one person in the Department of Human Services who had this responsibility, along with you know, $130 million of other programs where this program was uh, at that time $5 million. It's just been doubled to $11 million. And the, the, the person responsible for that pays attention, partially because this is one of those issues that the community said, we've got to do something about this, first of all, because we're wasting our money, and secondly, because we're not getting what we really uh, need for our, our children and our communities. Sometimes you just got to be a squeaky wheel. I would I would agree with that. Georgia, in addition to having the new code, also is going through a period of um, juvenile justice reform. And if you look online, the Pew Commission made recommendations about what our juvenile justice system looked like, and we were spending um, by detaining uh, children in in YDCs, our youth detention centers, we were spending. Ninety some thousand dollars a year with outcomes of, of high recidivism. So actually, kind of, like, as Judge Timberlake said, looking at um, how those resources are being spent. And so there's been a renewed interest on um, reinvesting the monies in communities where um, detention is reduced and looking at evidence-based practices. But again, I also looking at what you have and how you're spending it. I mean, I think the value of being able to look at your data and having somebody know what outcomes you're looking for and numbers, that does speak to people when you're when you're speaking your message. I think one of the things, I know Judge Timberlake has a, a business, uh, an MBA, I think, is that correct, Judge? Um, yes. As does our chief judge, and I think looking at maybe what you do as a business even though it's the business of, of helping families, um, tells your message and sends your message um, when you can put all that together and paint that picture. So it's been very helpful to have data at our hands that can tell our story and support our outcomes. So, so. Thank you. Um, if we uh, didn't get to your questions or you have any additional ones, um, you can find my contact information is up on the screen right now. You can feel free to send me any questions and I can forward that on to our presenters. Just as a reminder, the, re the recording of this webinar, in addition to the PowerPoint, will be posted on CJJ's website within 24 hours. I wanted to uh, thank both of our presenters again for such a wonderful presentation. And with that, I wish everyone a great day. Thank you. Thank you.